Direct from Foxborough, Massachusetts, the gem of Norfolk County, and taped at the studios of Foxborough Cable Access, it's Foxborough Central. And here's your host, Bob Hickey. And welcome to another episode of Foxborough Central. I am Bob Hickey, your host, thanking you for taking a little bit of time to sit with me and my guests as we talk about the people, events, and organizations that make Foxborough truly the gem of Norfolk County. And I'm honored today to be sitting with my friend, my favorite Democrat, Jim Timothy, how are you doing? Favorite Republican. Thank you. Well, uh, I'll, I'll take that as a badge of honor. Uh, Senator Timothy uh, from the Bristol Norfolk uh, District is uh, joining us tonight to talk a little bit about accomplishments. And you know, Jim, uh, by his own admission, is not one to brag, but I'm a big bragger kind of guy because I think that if you're going to put the work in to public service and you're going to create some positive outcomes. It doesn't just happen. You don't just show up at the office. Beacon Hill is not a place where everybody just pats you on the back and ho, ho, ho. A lot of work goes in it. You have to network, you have to build relationships. Uh, and by forging relationships, you sometimes have to step on some toes. And there's a lot of, a lot of personality up there uh, because we're all electing who we think is going to represent us best. But there's a you know, 40 of you people who represent each community best up on Beacon Hill in the Senate. And sometimes we don't all get together and elect the same people. So because of that, uh, a lot of credit to you for pushing through some legislation over the years. And you were first elected in 2004. 2004. 2004. Sworn in 2005, uh, January 2005. So I'm in my sixth term, 11 years. Uh, and it's uh, it's been a fascinating experience. I didn't know... I thought I would really enjoy the challenge and really enjoy the ability to, you know, you're, you're in a system that's designed for maximum participation. I was very lucky at an early age to kind of take that plunge and get into uh, po politics and get into elective office. I wasn't successful in my first run for Senate. It was my first run for anything. Any, any, and I was, right. I was 27. And, you know, but it was, I, if you get 300 certified signatures, and you go through the steps at the Secretary of State and Town Clerk, you know, you're on the ballot. And that's kind of uh, you know, wild when you think of it. I remember as, as being that young and seeing my name uh, on a primary and, and winning a primary uh, at, you know, at 27 in an elective office. And, and I ran against a very accomplished legislator and someone who had a broad resume, was a wonderful person, and had a great time doing it. it. Took me about took 12 months of a year. My golf game suffered and <laughs> didn't do much at the beach. But <clears throat> I'll tell you, it was one of the it was one of the best experiences I've ever had. Well, you know, and we all do what we do, and there's a, a path that leads each of us to wherever we're at. And with your path, I always and I never asked you about this. I, I hope you can speak to it a little bit. And and of course, you had uh, why you've been centered. You you've, you've started your family, and and you yeah. now have two kids, eleven and eight. Yeah, yeah. And two girls. Uh, and of course, your your wife supports you all the yeah. time when you come out and do things like this. Yeah. Uh, for no additional pay, and you're out here volunteering and you know touching the constituency wherever they are. So thank you for doing that. So. You know, I definitely owe her at least a cup of coffee, if not flowers. So. She knows a Beacon Hill update on uh, Foxborough Central is something I can't pass up. <laughs> well, then she's a good person. She can check us out, of course, at www.fcatv.org, shameless plug. But if you want to get a hold of the good senator, you can email him at james.timothy at masenate.gov. Right? Yeah. All right, I got that right. Yeah, that's All right. right. I didn't even have to check on my note. Yeah. Of course, they can also call you directly. And you know, one of the things about you is you're always accessible. Uh, I've never reached out and not been able to get hold of you, and I try not to do it too much. But 617-722-1222, and that's love, your direct line. Love, I love politics. <laughs> I love government. I love talking about it. I had started out in politics as an idealistic environmentalist who had worked uh, in a state agency, state agency that loved the the. Department of Conservation and Recreation, uh, worked my way from a golf course uh, in Canton across the street from my house all the way up into the commissioner's office and then had the idea to jump off and try to do, if, I'm like, somebody's going to do this. I you know, work enough with these people in community affairs that maybe I could do the job. And then by virtue of that loss, I spent five years in the private sector as a in a telecommunications company that was national, mm -hmm. uh, purchasing and distributing, distributing material all over the all over the Commonwealth and in, in many respects in the nation as well. But uh, working there before the 9-11 recession and then after when there were tremendous changes in the economy 
and very quickly on the governmental side, but on the private sector side. I think it gave me the right balance of government service. Government service is very important. Can't act like a business because it's not, but there should be some business principles in it. So I think that that, uh, you know, just having that green lampshade and going through uh, a purchase order and understanding, you know, what are we, at the end, at the end of the day, are we going to be able to keep the doors open tomorrow? That's provided me a, a good balance. And we all have different experiences. Mm -hmm. You know, there are lawyers, there are doctors, there are uh, former police officers. There's a, you know, a wide range. We wanted a citizen legislature and the, you know, the people who built this system, you know, the greatest country in the world, started to come from Massachusetts. The Massachusetts Constitution is what the United States Constitution is, is built on. So working in the same building with John Adams, Paul Revere, and John Hancock, uh, walked around on top of John Hancock's what was his cow pasture is uh, is a pretty heady experience for one day but never mind uh, 11 years and I think I've got a little better um, over the course of my career in you know dealing with knowing the neighborhoods knowing the issues knowing the people but then knowing how to do some things up at the state that would help um, to address their concerns both both with legislation and with dealing with state agencies. Well, that of course comes with experience as well as being intuitive and friendly and, and able to uh, you know, process. And I, I suppose it speaks directly to your staying power that you're able to bring that mix of, of private sector, public sector. And I know that in your family, you've got a history of public service also. So yeah. uh, maybe uh, being exposed to it at such an early age, well, you're maybe a little more predisposed to all the pains and joys of Beacon Hill than maybe the rest of, the, uh, the rest of us. Well, the absolute the irony <laughs> the irony of that the ultimate irony of that is growing up I absolutely it was my least favorite thing <laughs> my least favorite thing and it's I, my my parents now seeing me do it are just absolutely amazed I guess it would be if the kid if your child never had vegetables and then upon growing up and moving out of the house became a vegetarian I think that's how my mother views uh, this this career path but it is it's the ultimate irony that my dad having been in the been in the Senate and run for mayor of Boston. It was uh, something that I just absolutely couldn't stand, and now <laughs> now I'm immersed Here in it. I love it. I love it. <laughs> well, you know, I always uh, say that you never know what our kids are going to pick up from us yeah. uh, as parents, and uh, and uh, you know, you picked up some of the some of the more positive uh, attributes there. So well, good for you. That scares me because my two daughters absolutely can't stand. Uh, politics, so that, well, that that troubles me. We'll have to my, steer them in a in a different path. My daughter, uh, this past uh, week, uh, was part of a team at the college that hosted the local political debate up in North Adams, and she's also oh. one who hated my time as selectman when I was a local <laughs> elected official here, uh, because it was taking me away from home. So right. you just never can tell. Yeah. yeah. Never can tell. So let's talk about some accomplishments. You, you, the family, of course, is the number one accomplishment, but let's talk about some of the other things up on Beacon Hill in the 10 years, 11 years nearly, that yeah. you've served up there. There's been some key pieces of legislation that you have to be proud of. Uh, let's talk about one that I know of, uh, the 9-11, yeah. uh, the 911 yeah. um, call, uh, funding. Tell me about it. It's, it's, it's a fascinating realm of, of state service, which I don't think a lot of uh, people understand. I but don't. So. When you think of what, you know, what you think about what 9 everybody, every, almost to a person, all sleeps beneath the protection, beneath that blanket of protection at 911. If you hear a loud noise, if you hurt yourself, if you see an accident, if something untoward happens, almost instantly now, people would run for the phone or yell for somebody to run the phone, or now somebody dials in. Uh, and in recognition of that in the year 2008, and 2008 was a, was a year, that, that two-year term was a year for a lot of reforms. You know, there was the transportation reform, there was pension reform. There were a lot of big things that, that hit the paper. And then maybe because, you know, as I always say, we all crave immortality. I, I would always speak to the biggest reform of that year was my bill, which created, it removed the state emergency telecommunications board and created a smaller state 911 system uh, that would put some funds to bring an age, our aging infrastructure and our aging laws and regulations mm -hmm. into the next generation. And at that time, didn't even really know what the next generation is, but we're seeing this year as the, this, the, the entity that I created, the State 91 Department, is promulgating new regulations and, and going out to bid for what the next generation, what, you know, what we'll see in years to come. And it was, it was not easy because we were asking for the rate pay to pay an additional 
uh, small amount of money for this sure. life-saving service. But in doing that, uh, we have about 20 to $25 million a year that comes in to fund the system. Not off the general appropriation, not off the budget, but off a small fee that was being paid by, by users, by, users sure. by, by landline users and cell phone users. Important to see that, because I know I have to justify this to you as the Republican who doesn't like the taxes, <laughs> but uh, the wireline fee used to be $1.25 a month. So $1 and $1.25, we moved that down to 75 cents. But the uh, wireless, when it was, when wireless phones, there were so few when they came up with well, that regulation. I was just gonna say, this is back in 2006 when the technology was different and, yeah. and you know, who has landlines now? And, yeah. very, and had, very few. Had you not been that forward thinking, just think of where the funding source would be now. It wouldn't be there, we wouldn't have that right. level and we wouldn't have, and this does, this, pro this program does save lives. And we brought the wire down, which many elderly rely on their, you know, they, they didn't have at that time, you know, the, the cell phone, which you know, more young people did. So young people were paying 33 cents a month and older people or landline users were paying a uh, dollar. Mm -hmm. So we moved them down to 75 cents and we moved the wireless phone, the 33 cents up to 75 cents, which is one half at the time was one half of the national average. So it wasn't wasn't a big ask, I don't think, and I got the bill done on the floor without a, it was, it was unanimous. I think everybody understood we had done, put so much time and mm -hmm. so much effort into this and explained what this could do with new hardware, new software, new uh, equipment, new, new, new stations. And also we put in uh, an incentive for, um, for uh, PSAPs, public safety answering points, to regionalize. California does it with seven, New Hampshire does it I think with maybe one or no more than three public, we have 225, <laughs> you know, 225 public safety answering and that's points. And an that's an ongoing, um, so uh, it, we'll call it a battle, we'll call it an, on, it's in transition. There's a, there's a way to regionalize. But there's an opportunity. Yeah, so some of the smaller uh, peace apps that only answer, you know, 10 calls a week, you know, there's a way to bring them in and then give them, provide the resources for them to upgrade their equipment right. so they can get there faster, their call times will go down, the information that they'll be with the training they get will be that much better for the first responder who gets there and uh, we're, say, we're, we're changing outcomes and we're saving lives and that's over the course of that, of that time, that's somewhere in the neighborhood of $125 million that has been spent on improving and thinking about what the next generation is going to be and uh, I don't think it's been overburdensome. I don't think anybody's really noticed that. No, and you know, the, and so it all either. changes once you have to dial it for a family member, a loved one, or somebody you, you live there, especially in a, in a small town. Those uh, people in the white fire trucks or the blue, blue police cars, when they go out, they really feel that they're very likely to see a family member, or not a family member, but somebody that they know mm -hmm. in their community because it's such a small, special community. So giving them the right tools to change outcomes is, is only the right thing to do. And you know, I hate to say it, but that was, uh, I, I like to think. And then, as I always complain about transportation, I think my reform was a little bit better than that other one. <laughs> <laughs> well, of course, I'm speaking with Jim Timothy, who's our state senator, uh, representing F uh, Foxborough, and you're from Walpole and yeah. a number of other, and what other district, uh, towns? Uh, Medfield, Sharon, Foxborough, Walpole, Mansfield, Norton, Rehoboth, Seekonk, and Attleboro. It's a large district, yeah. so uh, thank you again for coming out to Foxborough and sharing with us. So uh, that is uh, obviously uh, one that has some uh, real results, and particularly since this was done in 2000, at the beginning of your, of your terms, um, you know, the technology has changed so much in the sense we now have Amber Alerts and we now have yeah. uh, cell technology that can, that can locate a 911 call where back then there wasn't 911 yeah. on the cell phone, I don't believe. No. Uh, uh, and, and so, you know, so many changes have happened and your committee is able to uh, continue to change and be, um, uh, uh, be able to be robust enough to be able to capture the new technology and implement it as opposed to being slow to respond. Yeah, yeah it's, and it, it, it continues to go on. I had a meeting with the Undersecretary um, of Executive Office of Public Safety, brought him down to Mansfield to check out their, uh, they have, a, they have a, a, a great GPS program that when that's on a tablet in each one of their, um, each one of their engines, each one of their rescues, any department vehicle has this, and it's not really, it's not necessary to have the internet. This really? is loaded onto there, and they have just about every bit of information that they can get on the on one, a structure, uh, family members in there, those with uh, those with disabilities. Really? When we did the hearing, we made certain to uh, to take 
to spend a lot of the time on the crafting of the bill, the language of the bill, and also the hearing. When we did the public hearing, we arranged to have distance participation for those who have uh, disabilities. You know, we had a TTY phone there. I think it was one of the, it, it's literally one of the, the broadest outreaches from inside the building to, to participants who, based on challenges of mobility or, or just, can't, just can't get there, that they were able to participate. Because wow. if you have a disability, you're, uh, you know, um, if you're on the, on, the, on the spectrum, if you have some other challenges, that you might be, it's about seven times more likely that you're gonna be interacting with 911, and we wanna make sure, as I say, that those outcomes are the best for those responding and for who we're responding to. And there's a way to do it, and that, that, that bill uh, certainly, certainly did that. Well, it seems like you're very passionate about that, and thank you so much for that piece of legislation. But we're gonna go rapid fire, because I can sit here and talk okay. to you for five hours, and they won't let me have five hours. Can okay. you believe that? I, I can't believe I that. Can't I can't believe that either. Teen tanning. Teen tanning. Uh, just passed a bill in the Senate, something we've been working on for, uh, something I've been working on for about 10 years. Uh, I think it's a, it's a necessary delay in an experience, an age-appropriate delay in experience for somebody because uh, the more UV damage uh, that you have and exposure to sun and exposure to these, to these lamps is very definitely uh, UV damage. It's cumulative. It never goes away. So by delaying that experience, we think we're going to, and the reason why is that the rates of diagnosis of melanoma uh, have changed. And what usually what you would see in a dermatologist's office and having some of these very scary diagnoses, mm -hmm. you'd usually see somebody who was out, worked outside and you know maybe fair complected and in their 50s, 60s, 70s. That has started to change precipitously over the last generation. And these are, this is something I've collaborated with the Mass Academy, Mass Academy of Dermatology, uh, with Dana Farber, and with the American Cancer Society, that they see a troubling uptick in uh, young women in their late 20s, early 30s. And some of it is attributable to being outside and not being wise with sun protection. Right. But the other part of it is it's, it's also when the start of the use of indoor tanning beds uh, had come along. I was just going to say, and it's amazing with the uh, introduction of that, that at the same time, the improvements in cancer screening and education, and uh, uh, October is uh, Cancer Awareness Month, yeah. and, and it just seems like there's such a disconnect between the commercial uh, tanning beds and the common sense approach, as well as the science and, and really understanding what causes uh, create the issue and what treatments are there and what preventative measures you should take. I just don't get it. Well, the World Health Organization, uh, the FDA, uh, the USDA and the FDA list these, uh, uh, the, the tanning booth right, right. as akin to or equal to um, arsenic and some other toxic, toxics. Interesting. To and uh, New Hampshire has done this. Some other states have done this. Nevada has done it. California has done it. Uh, Texas and Louisiana have done it. So we were a, we were a leader when we filed the bill in, in, in 10 years ago in 2005, 2006, and it passed the Senate uh, unanimously. Mm -hmm. And it's nobody under 18. It's something that the World Health Organization, and this is the American Cancer Society's uh, number one legislative priority in Massachusetts this year. So I hope, I, I hope to get it done. It's, uh, it's, you know, there's some, once you're 18, Again, you can do what you want. Do what you want. I haven't thought that. Unfortunately, that there's, there's the health insurance now that there's universal health care uh, that uh, really makes an issue where if you're treating yourself in such a way that's going to cost the collective money, there's got to be some you know, penalty or some, some pushback as far as I do this to myself and then I expect everybody else to help pay for it when I do it to the point where I have a problem. So I don't know, there, it looks like it's an easier question than not have an answer to because there's so many different layers of, uh, of, of responsibility that you would say, oh, so you're 16, you have the situation now and what choices did you make when you're 30? And unfortunately, we don't always make the best decisions when we're 18, 20, and 30, but still. It, it's a deeper issue, yeah, it's, it, a little it's, more uh, societal issue there. It, it certainly is, and I haven't thought that that was the only problem in, in this, and, and I had uh, filed a revenue neutral, uh, if, if, school, if school district would adopt the EPA Sunwise Safety Program, they could get the curriculum, they could get the, uh, all that they needed um, from, the, from the United States federal government, and it could be taught in schools, which just teaches kids to be sure. maybe a little bit uh, smarter about how they deal with um, going out and you know maybe making some small steps uh, to prevent this is one of the most preventable 
forms of cancer that are out there. And it all starts with education, so great. Uh, uh, if I could touch on another subject, uh, I know that there's one that was uh, very uh, near and dear to you. Uh, two firefighters in Boston uh, lost their lives uh, driving a truck. No, it was, it was a, this was the Boylston fire. The Boylston Street fire oh, that just, one, yes. just a year and a half ago okay. uh, from uh, 33 and 15, two firefighters uh, lost their lives. And then not long after that, a, uh, or very, very close to that event, um, a Plymouth uh, police officer had passed away. And I have mm -hmm. the chair of, uh, of Public Safety and Homeland Security. So on a daily basis, I'm dealing with, uh, and then to socially also, I deal with a lot of uh, fire, those public safety officers that work to protect us. And you'd like to be able to do it for everybody, but in this sense, you have to have you know, a, a subset that you can, sure. you, you can control. And if a uh, so police, officer, the police like. officer, correction officer, or firefighter passes away in the line of duty, their children uh, would be able to go uh, to college uh, with uh, tuition, room, board, and fees would be paid for at a state by school. the Commonwealth. But not just at a state school, mm -hmm. you would get the equivalent of what UMass is if you went to a private school. Really? Yeah. So there's uh, that was choice. that was something that's great. I came out of the uh, Plymouth funeral and went to both went to both firefighters and then to the police officer's funeral. Came out of it and had run into um, uh, major, uh, minority leader Bruce Tarr and uh, Senate President uh, Terry Murray, and they thought about as they were, as they as we watched the the families grieving uh, during these tragic times. You know, what do we do for what can we do for the kids? And I said, I have a bill in the Committee on Public Service. It's ready to go to, to kind of even out these, uh, these, these benefits. And well, it's a small we cost. It's a small cost for the sacrifice they give, so. Yeah, in the grand scheme of things, we wouldn't, we wouldn't notice it. And, and based on, you know, your, your hot strings being pulled, there's, there's, we're always looking to expand a spectrum, you know, a small spectrum to somebody really worthy. And I think that, that those families, certainly, they'll never, they'll never get there. Sure. They'll never get that hero back. But also with the kids growing up without a parent, there's enough challenges mm -hmm. and uh, at least it's some small way to ensure that they'll have some opportunity uh, when they get to be 18 and ready to go on. And I think most in the Commonwealth would agree to the virtues Absolutely. of that bill. So uh, you, you touched on your chairmanship, uh, your work on the Public Safety and Homeland Security Committee. Yeah. So you're the chairman of that? Chairman of that, yeah. Okay. Yeah. So yeah. You've, been, you've been doing that for quite a while yes, now. Yes. I've, uh, I've got eight years. I've got uh, four terms working on five. Wow. Uh, doing that, it's a, it's, it's a, it's a great committee. You have, a, you have a, some ability to, uh, because if seven thousand bills come in, and the logic behind the committee is that there are certain specialties that really should be assigned some bills to go through them, look at the merits, you know, work them out. There's five members of the Senate, eleven members of the House on that joint committee. So there's two chairs, a House chair and a, and a Senate chair, and mm -hmm. we're tasked with holding a public hearing, and. Um, and truly vetting the bills and then make some changes to them and send them out and report them either to the House or the Senate. If, uh, if it's a bill that doesn't have much support, and I've had a few of those, uh, it could either get a not not to pass or it can go to a study. But when you get, if you get a favorable recommendation from the committee, you either go to the Committee on Ways and Means if it has a cost to the Commonwealth to be discussed or it goes to steering and policy and then it works its way and hopefully if it's your bill, you get a chance to see, it, see the light of the chamber. So you've been doing this for a while, and you enjoy this. Yes, I do. It's it's, it's been a lot of fun. It's a, it had some challenges. Uh, we had a bill before us uh, in the aftermath of Sandy Hook. Where President Murray sure. called me up and said, uh, "I'm gonna, uh, I, I want you to be ready. I'm gonna make, I'm gonna tell the Senate clerk that all bills related to firearms are gonna come to uh, the Committee on Public Safety, not go to Judiciary, or not be a split. And uh, when that happens, I want you to." put them all together and get something done. And the reason would be so you can create a consolidated effort and, and mm -hmm. maybe a unified voice. Yeah, yeah. and we had, you know, we had some, Massachusetts had some, uh, had some tough and restrictive gun laws, you know, and, and uh, there's been a lot of work, but there were some inconsistencies also in those gun laws and there was an arbitrary uh, decision in some uh, police departments about who could get uh, a, who could get a firearm and who couldn't. Because uh, if I'm not incorrect, the local municipality, the police chief really controls who's mm -hmm. eligible for a gun permit uh, for either a concealed or just to have. Yeah. And so there could be some personalities or it could just be different philosophical yeah. approaches that would create disparity across the communities. That, and, and that did happen. It was, it was the suitability standard. They were able to determine who was suitable. Uh, everybody had, a, had an ability to get an FID card, which would give them access to um, a rifle or a shotgun. 
maybe for maybe uh, maybe the idea at the time was for hunting purposes. Mm -hmm. uh, it was uh, it was a shall on the FID, and it was may based on a suitability standard. Problem with the suitability standard, it was arbitrary and capricious, and there were some communities that just no matter what did not want to issue a license. Uh, for all lawful, lawful purposes to an individual, uh, not not presently, but the city of Quincy had been like that, mm -hmm. and some of the some of the reasons were so um, you really couldn't defend them that they took them to court and they won mm -hmm. in Massachusetts. Mm -hmm. The gun owners actually 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 won. And I think that's the problem. When you have a law that's not enforceable, mm -hmm. then what do you do? And you really do have to have some sort of a regulatory mechanism. So. So what we, happened? We, we, we did, uh, did hearings. I, I insisted that we do hearings uh, similar to what Senate President Rosenberg had done. He had the redistricting committee. So what he did is he took the redistricting committee to all corners of the Commonwealth. He did, I think, 11 hearings. I was on that committee with him, and I went to eight of them. So I told uh, the president, and then uh, he was then president pro tem, I told Stanley I was going to use his model. So we went around the, around the Commonwealth to engage and solicit people's input on their thoughts about firearms, and then hoping that they would understand that we weren't having a national debate. Mm -hmm. We were having, I could only control what right. mass general law is, and then through that, to some sense, uh, Commonwealth mass re regulation. But we went, we did uh, 42, 42 hours of hearings uh, in six different sites, and I think we, uh, we came up with what was a, was a pretty good compromise. In fact, it was viewed positively by the Gun Owners Action League and the Stopped Handgun Violence, and that's the first That's quite an accomplishment. Ever. Yeah. So that speaks to your ability to forge some bridges. And I think, speaking of bridges, um, recently uh, State Senate uh, Leader Rosenberg yeah. tasked you, yeah, we you, to... you were voluntold perhaps, Yes, voluntold. to uh, <laughs> chair another committee. I think he was... So now you're a dual chair. Double chair, yes. Double chair. <clears throat> Tell me. Yeah. He, what, uh, what the president had suggested to me, he's like, I'm going to put you back in, because it's the president's choice. He, he assigns committees. Uh, that's, that's by, it's, it's always been that way. And he assigns the committee chairs and he, in, in committee membership, and he said that based on the effort around firearms, which, you know, it's, that's one of the most difficult things to get any kind of consensus yes. and any kind of agreement on. And he said, based on the success that, that I had had, in that effort that he was going to give me the public service committee with um, the elephant in the room being the uh, state's uh, unfunded liability on its pension system, mm. OPEP, outside wow. of pen pension okay. employee benefits. That's a big one. So I have that, that challenge, which, will, which means the same amount of meetings, the same amount of, um, of hearings, the same amount of time working on you know, what is. It's, 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 a, it's a very difficult issue. I know that Foxborough has been very have been good stewards of of their fiduciary responsibility relative to that. Probably one of the gold standards. Really, um, I, I would I would think that you, with that direct funding source that comes in every year, not making it make, not making it the whim, or not the, not the whim, but there are so many challenges in town meeting, and I think you no know, people don't understand how vetted each and every line item at town meeting is. You know, and, and you bring up a great point. Of course, what uh, State Senator Jim Timothy, Jim Timothy is talking about is the a percentage of the uh, local meals tax initiative that goes directly towards the OPEB uh, and meals tax. And in Foxborough, it's a 50-50 split by our board of selectmen, and they have to make that decision every budget year. So it's not something that's written in stone. It's something that can change. But the promise made back at town meeting, as you say, everything gets vetted, uh, was that uh, the intention was that it would be a 50-50 split, and that's where uh, we've made some great progress. And, of course, Randy Scollins is our finance director who's uh, uh, been great as far as educating us and making sure that we understood uh, the pain that was going to happen if we left this unfunded yeah. and creating this funding opportunity that made it relatively painless yeah. because it doesn't really attack our general fund here in Foxborough. So uh, at a state level, it sounds like Foxborough is doing okay. Huh? Without a doubt. Without a doubt, I think that you know that there is there's been a great deal of progress um, on some town levels and in other communities next to nothing, which I think the the part of what we're what we're going to try to do on the state level is make sure that that everybody is paying their fair share because if you're doing it very well and then some of the larger communities, the usual suspects, are not doing anything with much bigger footprints uh, in this regard and much bigger liability. Uh, is that you could be adversely impacted if, if the Commonwealth is. At the end of the day, the Commonwealth would have to own 
anything, right. but that's, that's our tax dollars. That's why when somebody complains about the MBTA, I listen to them because everybody is impacted because anybody pays one nick, one, one seventh into the, mm -hmm. uh, into the, into the t sales tax, uh, they're paying a penny. Penny's going to them. Jim Timothy is our state senator. I'm going to give you the last word. Thank you so much for taking time. We are so out of time. I'm going to remind you at home that you can get a hold of the good senator by emailing him at james.timothy at masenate.gov, or you can call him up at the office at 617-722-1222. Friend him on Facebook. Become a Twitter follower. He's got some good folks in the office that'll make sure that you're taken care of with any inquiries. So Jim, thank you so much for your service. I don't know if you hear it often enough, but uh, we really do appreciate all the work that goes into it. And just this brief half hour we spent, sounds like you're doing even more work than I thought. So thank you again. Thanks very much for having me. And thank you friends for taking the time to watch with us. On behalf of the good Senator Jim Timothy, I'm Bob Hickey, your host, and you have a wonderful day, Fox Pro. Take care. Thank you.